So my name is uh, Helge Ebers. I'm professor for membrane biochemistry at the Free University in Berlin. And uh, we are very much interested in membrane compartmentalization, something that we share uh, with our host. And uh, we have been selected for today's journal club for a recent paper from a finishing grad student from the lab, Jia Hui Li. Um, that was published earlier this year. And what she did there was uh, she used tiny magnetic fluorescent particles and pulled them using magnets over uh, the cell surface. And I would like to share with you now why we did this and what we think we may be able to do with it. And uh, maybe this would be interesting for you or uh, your work. So uh, do we just jump right Thanks. in? Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, we are very excited about this paper. So just uh, start whenever you want. All right. So uh, uh, here, obviously, this is a fluorescence micrograph of a cell. Here you can see trajectories of this uh, particle that we can pull all the way to the edge of the cell. And then it sort of travels around the edge of the cell here and gets, gets stuck. And this is already one feature that I really want to uh, drag your attention to is that we have very high accuracy, right? So we can use the extremely high pointing accuracy of fluorescent particles together with pulling the molecule into a specific direction. Thereby we wanna learn something about the places where these molecules will get stuck or where they stop moving. Where we come from is we want to understand how membranes are compartmentalized. All of you were obviously uh, familiar with the Singer-Nicholson model uh, from 1972. Uh, where uh, Singer and Nicholson uh, synthesized a number of uh, recent observations on uh, what plasma membranes may be uh, made of and consist of and how they may be assembled from lipids and proteins into these fluent, uh, fluid and continuous bilayers, right? So a membrane protein would be embedded in a, uh, a mosaic of lipids and proteins in which these molecules are free to move. And as an illustration, I brought to you here a quantum dot that is bound to a lipid in a supported membrane bilayer. And you can see that this molecule here is, of course, absolutely free to move and just wiggles around in a random motion uh, uh, through this membrane bilayer. Okay, so it's diffusing. Already pretty early after the 70s, a number of uh, 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 investigators such as uh, Mike Sheets and Aki Kusumi and Ken Jacobson and, and, and others and De Brabander um, used uh, modern video microscopy to investigate what is happening in membranes. And immediately they found that in plasma membranes, um, proteins are actually not entirely free to move. Indeed, the diffusion coefficient is like an order of magnitude or more slower than would be expected in uh, free uh, lipid bilayers. And they started investigating this. And the uh, most elaborate model here stems from decades of work in the uh, laboratory of Aki Kasumi, who has correlated um, movies with extremely high uh, frame rate imaging of, of uh, lipids or proteins bound to gold beads or, or fluorescent particles. And what he and others would observe is that they would sort of seem to jump between domains in which they would reside for a certain amount of time. And when they did a platinum replica EM microscopy of the plasma membrane, they found that the cortical actin at the membrane would form these little corrals. And that led to a so-called fence model uh, that uh, Aki Kusumi has been putting forward on how these corrals of actin filaments at the membrane basically uh, uh, compartmentalize the membrane and proteins have a hard time jumping over these fences when they diffuse around in the plasma membrane. Okay. So we now try to understand how this works, if that is really indeed the case, and what forms of membrane compartmentalization exist. So diffusion barriers, like obstacles to the motion of membrane lipids are ubiquitous in cell biology. Um, so uh, the sperm head is divided from the tail by a barrier that separates membrane proteins from diffusing back and forth. There is the tight junction in epithelia separates the apical from the basolateral membrane. The celial plasma membrane is indeed a different compartment from the apical membrane. So it's a different complement of membrane proteins in here than in the remainder of the membrane. Neurons 
uh, have a diffusion barrier in the initial segment that separates the axonal membrane proteins from the somatodendritic membrane proteins and dendritic spines are as well compartmentalized, allowing only selective access to um, their head in which the excitatory synapses sit. Finally, uh, dividing cells also have a diffusion barrier around the cleavage furrow, and that seems to be, at least in yeast, at least in yeast cells, even be present in the endoplasmatic reticulum and the uh, nuclear envelope. So um, the, the specific regulation and physical uh, hindrance of membrane protein motion is a ubiquitous phenomenon in cell biology, and we, we try to understand how this works. So in the uh, initial segment here, uh, this diffusion barrier is one of the first ones that has been described and uh, investigated in great detail. First, uh, by a paper from uh, the uh, EMBL, from Toshiki Kobayashi and Carlos Dotti's lab, who found that if they would use a, a, a pipette filled with fluorescent lipids and touch the axon with it, they would move through the axon, but they would not move out to the um, cytop uh, to the to the cell body. Okay. A couple of years later, uh, Bettina Winkler in Muming Pu's lab found that this was likely due to the soma just being so much larger than the axon that you just couldn't detect these fluorescent lipids, and she could not define uh, find a diffusion barrier here. Only to a couple of years later, uh, uh, doing some work with Ira Melman and Paul Forscher, a great expert on the neuronal cytoskeleton. Uh, um, to investigate using optical tweezers, pulling membrane proteins through the initial segment that they would get stuck in the initial segment and they could not move there, okay? This was then further investigated by uh, Aki Kasumi, who could correlate the motion of membrane proteins to the accumulation of an adapter molecule called Anchorin G, and that was published in uh, Nature Cell Biology in 2003. So, uh, 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 yeah. So we are interested now in this um, diffusion barrier here at the axon initial segment that separates the somatodendritic domain uh, from the axonal domain. And here what we find is a specific complement of adapter molecules, uh, cytoskeletal molecules such as spectrins, ion channels, and adhesion molecules that make a specific array that is about 60 to 90 microns long. And uh, this separates the axonal membrane proteins from the dendritic uh, membrane proteins, which makes a lot of sense because of course the somatodendritic part integrates and receives signals and the axonal part sends out signals. Okay, so you don't wanna mix that up. Now it's long known that we have a diffusion barrier here. So uh, we got really excited when in 2013, uh, the Zhao Zhuang lab published the fantastic observation that along the initial segment, there would be an array of rings of actin circumfering the axon. Okay, so every 200 nanometer, you would have this actin ring that goes around the axonal membrane. Now for us, of course, this was a fantastic way of testing whether these actin rings we find here in the axon initial segment could be used as a paradigm to finally test the Kasumi model, right? So they could never uh, really look at the actin uh, at the same time as the proteins, because the actin cortex obviously is very plastic. So it, it constantly moves and there's so much actin in the cell that it's very, very hard, even with modern super resolution methods to get a reasonable resolution of these compartments and in the time scale that is comparable to membrane protein motion. So here we now have these rings that are persistent over longer time and we were hopeful to correlate that motion to the, uh, the, that structure to the motion of membrane proteins, and we could indeed do this. And here you could see, can see a single particle tracking data of lipid anchored GFP, GPI, GFP coupled to quantum dots. And we could localize indeed that these stripes are right between these actin rings. Okay, so the membrane molten protein diffuses between these actin rings and has a hard time in this we could model of jumping over that actin ring. Now we are very happy to, to publish this and we're really excited to present this to uh, Kusumi and others um, as a way of investigating um, membrane protein motion to find uh, uh, direct evidence for the Kusumi model. But of course, um, uh, we always have to be skeptical, right? So uh, 
uh, um, one idea that is prevalent, especially in the initial segment field, stems from uh, the observation that where we have these actin rings, these actin rings are interspaced by spectrin tetramers. Okay. So these elongated spectrum tetramers are about 190 nanometer long, and they have binding sites for a large adapter molecule called Ancrin G. And this Ancrin G recruits a lot of huge ion channels, like five nanometer diameter, eight nanometer diameter, huge ion channels, and also adhesion molecules, and plenty of them. So what we actually indeed have in between these actin rings is kind of like a forest of all these ion channels. Okay, so when you talk to initial segment people, they say, well, I'm not so sure that your membrane protein actually bumps into the actin rings. Maybe it's rather that it sort of gets stuck between all these ion channels and is just not moving out. So um, we like uh, uh, complicated experiments, I have to confess. We like, uh, <laughs> we just like uh, really uh, things that are complicated but are to the point. So what we thought we should do is we should try and image a single membrane protein and then pull it across this area. Okay, so now we would either just pull it through the membrane and it would kind of get stuck in between all these ion channels and then we could pull it again. Or when we pull it, it will bump into the actin and then we can pull it through to the next ring and it will bump into the acting and, and we can pull it on, okay? So, and by combining a means to pull the membrane protein with um, very high resolution single particle tracking, we were hopeful that we could achieve this. So uh, optical tweezers are, you know, expensive to set up and we didn't have them. Uh, so we looked into uh, much simpler means than that and we decided to go for the magnetic nanoparticles. Okay, so we went through quite a few. I have to say, not all magnetic fluorescent particles you can buy are really very useful and nice. So it was really um, a several months of work just to figure out which ones work well and which ones are monodispersed and bind without background, and you can still move them and they are bright enough and so on. But we found some uh, where we have an iron core that is surrounded by a starch shell and that is then coupled to streptavidin and so we can then bind it to biotinylated nanobodies or biotinylated lipids on supported membrane bilayers. Okay, so we can throw these nanoparticles into um, a light scattering uh, device and we can see they're nicely monodispersed. Okay, so we have a single peak around 200 nanometer in size um, this is pretty much in agreement with the uh, electron microscopy images we get of these iron cores. So they, the real particles will be a little bigger because there's a starch shell around it, which we can't see. I like this one. It looks like a gummy bear a little bit, uh, if you like. Um, so hopefully uh, this is going to be a little more round when it then finally binds to the cell. Okay. So we then uh, made supported membrane bilayers in these uh, uh, cover glass bottom uh, dishes. And we were thankful to get uh, from friends a micro manipulator we could use to deliver a, a tiny magnet. And attached to the magnet, we have a metal wire that we pulled to be very, very um, uh, 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 thin at the tip. Okay. So basically, we have a very strong neodyme magnet and a little wire that you can't see here, it's so fine. And then we dip it into the um, uh, solution where our cell sits, and then we try to do microscopy. Okay. So this is basically the setup. You have your objective. You, you, have, uh, you can bring it into less than uh, 800 micrometer distance, and then your magnet uh, is parallel to the cover glass in a couple of uh, microns above the cover. So we can't really tell. Uh, we just kind of try to almost touch it um, and then move the tip. Here you can see the tip um, towards the cell. This is the tip of the wire, right? So the wire is here attached to the magnet. Um, this is what it then looks like. Here you can see this is a supported membrane bilayer. Um, uh, we can now pull 
couple of these particles. You can see some of them are clearly stuck. Uh, some of them don't really care so much about the magnet, but a couple of them really clearly move towards the, the needle that is to the right here. Okay, um, we can localize these particles very accurately. Here you can see uh, a couple of hundred subsequent localizations of a single particle. As you can see it's just a few nanometers uh, error uh, we can achieve um, using these particles. Okay. What we of course did was we looked at hundreds of, of trajectories of particles on supported membrane bilayers and then quantified uh, the force they experienced um, according to the distance. So the closer you go with a magnet, the higher the force gets. Now the force is not extremely high. We're talking femtonewton here, um, but this is of course uh, um, good enough to pull it through uh, water and also through uh, the membrane bilayer, but you would have a hard time competing uh, against uh, strong cellular forces. And this is exactly what we want. We don't want to disrupt anything in the cell. We just basically want to move it and see if it experiences some kind of drag uh, in some parts of the membrane. So if we go closer, we can really see that uh, according to the distance, it really rises up to about one uh, femtonewton. Okay. So this is before, there's no apparent force. They just wiggle around in, in X as well as Y direction, it doesn't really matter. But when we add the magnet, we have a clear um, femtonewton force in X direction, okay, in this direction. Um, so to test how accurately we can, we can measure the motion of the particle, we, we looked at some defects in our membrane. So you can see a fluorescent supported membrane bilayer. This dark area is a, is a patch on the cover glass where bilayer could not be formed. And we could see when we now pull these particles, they move towards the edge of the bilayer and then they move along that bilayer. And you can see already here that from the trajectory, you can see these very well-defined little areas of membrane. And if we now zoom into this little trajectory here, you can see that we have very fine detail and a pretty straight line. Okay, so this gives you already a little bit of a hint and we're gonna further look into this one here. This gives you a little bit of a hint as to how, uh, uh, how uh, accurately we can localize our particles. Here, this is two microns and you can see this is where the fluorescence uh, goes down, um, where the edge of the membrane is. And you can see that there's a very well-defined edge um, where the particle, uh, um, approaches and approaches and approaches, but can't come across. Okay, so you, this is basically the error of the measurement of the membrane edge you can see from, from this particle uh, trajectory. And this uh, made us hopeful that by later correlating the motion of the particle to fixed cellular structures, we would be able to um, see where the particle then finally would get stuck. Um, the next challenge was, of course, to go for cellular particles. So we used our magnetic nanoparticles, coupled GFP nanobodies to them via biotin stripped evident linkage, and then uh, coupled this to a lipid anchored GFP molecule. Okay, so this is a CV1 cell that expresses GPI GFP. Um, and we then add the particles to the top of the cell, and then they move around the membrane, and we can pull them clearly in the direction of. The magnet, you've seen this went actually pretty fast, right? Now we did this for a number, so you can see the movie again. So we did this for a number of particles and a number of membrane proteins. So the simplest one would be the lipid anchor GPI GFP with the fluorescent magnetic, magnetic nanoparticle attached to it. But we also had a standard LYFP GT46. This is a standard transmembrane uh, probe, which has the transmembrane domain of the LDL uh, receptor. Um, coupled to a, a GFP on the outside and the transferrin receptor, which is also an often used probe for single particle tracking where we also have a GFP on the outside here, a YFP. And no matter what protein uh, we used, all of them, GFP, GPI, uh, YFP, GD46, or transferrin receptor GFP, they would exhibit random motion before we tracked them uh, when we 
approached the sample with a magnet, they would move into the direction of the magnet. And then when we removed the magnet, they would uh, resume random motion in the plane of the membrane. And uh, uh, we could show that this was specific binding. Here you can see this is in transfected cell. This is a neighboring untransfected cell. You can see that these particles, they only bind to the transfected cell um, using uh, confocal microscopy. We can see that they are nicely on top of the cell uh, and not don't bind to the cover slip or anything. And when we then quantified the uh, difference in diffu diffusion coefficient of uh, many, many particles and many, many cells before and after, uh, we could see that uh, globally speaking, there's no difference uh, in particle diffusion before and after uh, they were pulled. So uh, it doesn't seem that we introduce any uh, greater effects just by pulling them a little bit through the membrane. Okay? So this is a freely diffusing, normally behaving membrane molecule before you pull it, then you pull it through the membrane and it can just resume its lateral motion again. Our aim, of course, is now to correlate the motion of these particles to um, uh, obstacles inside the cell membrane. And to do so, we perform storm imaging of the actin cortex. So uh, we have a, a 3D capable uh, a storm microscope so we can distinguish the dorsal side, so the back of the cell from the ventral side. Um, here you can see uh, ventral actin cables and then the dorsal. Um, uh, um, um, filaments. You can see this is dorsal, this is ventral actin. And of course, when we look at molecules that bind to the top surface of the cell, we want to correlate motion to these dorsal actin fibers, right? So here you can see again GPI GFP expressed in a CD1 cell. Uh, we can then see as we pull this molecule through the membrane, it kind of hits a barrier, slides along that barrier. And then, so it hits the barrier, it slides along the barrier, and then it seems to get stuck, okay? Um, and when, so of course, this is where the magnet is, right? So it tries to move towards the magnet, and then it somehow hits a barrier, and it finally gets stuck. So now if you look at the same area in wide field actin imaging, we can see that there's some prominent actin structures there. This is the dorsal actin, and the 3D uh, storm, and here's the correlation. Here's the correlation of the trajectory with the actin filaments, and you can see that uh, it kind of moves between a couple of actin bits, and then it gets stuck on this longer filament, tries to find a way moving along it, but finally gets caught in between the actin cortex. So I hope I could convince you that using this method, we can. Uh, detect obstacles to the motion of membrane proteins in the uh, plasma membrane. So this is how far we got in this uh, story. And uh, we hope that in the future, uh, we will be able to use this to further investigate diffusion barriers in the uh, plane of the membrane of cells. So our first aim is of course now to go back to the diffusion barrier in the neurons and then see if we can see any compartmentalization using this method in uh, neurons that correlate with these 200 nanometer distance uh, um, actin rings. But of course, there's other assays one can imagine that this could be useful for. Um, of course, one of the biggest problems that we face in membrane biology is quantifying uh, molecular events such as receptor dimerization, right? So a lot of people try to do this by uh, blinking or by co-localization studies or by clustering or by all kinds of uh, statistics. However, if you imagine you would have a two subunits of a dimerizing receptor, one of them would be fluorescent and the other one would carry a magnetic tag, and you would now add a magnet to it, you could see that the true dimers, so molecules that are really interacting, they would move um, uh, whereas other dimers, apparent dimers, that are only appear to co-localize within a certain distance would tear apart the magnetic part of the dimer and we could move. So we could calculate a fraction of molecules that would be uh, dimers. Of course, like all these um, dimer 
assays, this would still be, be dependent on quantitative labeling, but uh, this would be something we would have to figure out uh, like in all assays. So um, with that, um, I am already finished uh, with uh, the work from this paper. Uh, this work has been done by Jia Hui Li, uh, who is uh, pictured here uh, when she's just about to win the poster prize at the Biophysical Society meeting this year. So that was uh, very exciting for us. Um, she is soon to be starting, uh, hopefully, her postdoc, uh, and we look forward for a very exciting uh, PhD defense. Uh, she has done this work together with the Paula Santos Otte, uh, undergrad student who's been spearheading the initial experiments in the lab. Uh, Braden Au has been uh, uh, computing software to overlay trajectories and super resolution uh, data. Stefan Block helped us with. Uh, calculation of forces in uh, supported membrane bilayers, uh, and Jakob uh, helped as well with uh, super resolution uh, imaging. And with that, I want to thank uh, our funding agency, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, who has been very generous, and I'm open for uh, your questions. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Hage. Such a fantastic story. Um, thank you. Really, really lovely, and congratulations for Gia and you thank as you. well. Um, so I'd like to start with my own questions by mm -hmm. tradition. So you said um, you are not really changing the diffusion coefficient of the molecule by pulling it. You're just directing mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you actually change the diffusion coefficient of the molecule? Can you apply more force, let's say, mm. um, stronger magnetic field? So we could get closer. So there are people. So when I looked around into this, if it would make sense to go in that direction, I found a guy who actually has a needle that has an, that is like an electromagnet, right? That would of course be much superior to what we do. And that would be really exciting to do because you could tune the, the strength of the field and thereby more accurately influence membrane protein motion. Um, but this was like a you know, defense project. So, <laughs> so this is outside of our budget. Uh, so um, I think that would be, of course, very exciting, but it's uh, beyond our technical capabilities. So of course you detect, right? As soon as you pull, you detect an apparent difference in diffusion coefficient, but that is because you have two components. You have the diffusion and the pull. And related to this, mm -hmm. now you're pulling things towards the side of the membrane. If Can you pull the things towards the center of the membrane so that you actually collect some molecules towards the center to, let's say, induce some mm -hmm. curvature mm -hmm. or induce some yeah. crowding in the cell? I guess one could attack something from the top. Um, yeah, I think I think that should be possible. We we never tried really to go like this with the needle, right? I guess it could be be possible because the forces are uh, weak enough, right? So this is based on uh, we of course of course indebted to the late Maxime Daan and Jakob Pila and others, uh, Fred Etoc, who have been using intracellular magnetic particles and they have been covering them with activated CDC42, so they could pull them around in the cell. This, this clump of magnetic particles inside the cell. And wherever they would then let it be, it would have a burst of actin polymerization and stuff like that, right? So I think that could be possible, especially if you compare it with like, I don't know, holding a GUV in direction of a magnet or something. This, of course, one could imagine, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, this will be, this is super, super cool technique. Mm. You can do endless things. You can induce mm. whatever in the cell. You can induce a domain and you see, you know, if it recruits yeah. some other molecules. Okay, I still have more questions, but I'll start with the mm -hmm. questions by the audience. So sure. Ed, mm -hmm. Ed, Ed Jenkins from Oxford is asking, mm -hmm. this is really cool. Can you apply this setup to achieve repulsion instead of pulling? And have you tried to apply it in a perpendicular manner? Yeah, so I think perpendicular we just talked about, so we, we have not done that. Repulsion, so the thing is with these tiny particles, they are not actually magnetic like a magnet, right? So it's just too little iron in there. Um, so they are uh, paramagnetic or super paramagnetic, so basically they can become attracted by the magnet, 
but they themselves cannot act like a magnet and be repulsed by the respective pole of the magnet. So this unfortunately doesn't work in these very, very tiny uh, magnetic uh, uh, particles. So you need more mass uh, to, to achieve that, to really have a permanent magnet. Thank you, Helge. So the next question is by Xin Zhao. Very interesting story and fantastic tool. Can it be applied for intracellular membrane protein study, for example, ER membrane proteins? Yeah, well, I mean, usually all you have to do is to get the magnetic particle inside. Um, so, you know, it's possible. Um, it may not be all that physiological. I, I was first, I thought about this very, in the beginning, the first time when I heard about this uh, thing called magnetogenetics, right? So there are people used ferritin, which is a iron harvesting molecule, and basically couple that to an iron channel. And then they claimed that they could pull on the ferritin, which basically has a tiny iron cluster, to open the iron channel. Now that, um, has been very, very controversial um, because uh, some physicists that know a lot about magnetism could quickly demonstrate mathematically that this is entirely impossible um, because um, there's not enough iron in there. So you really need like 50, 100 nanometer iron core to even be possible to, to be able to move it at all. So it's unfortunately so far, I haven't found a way to genetically encode uh, a magnetic particle. That would of course be wonderful. The closest that gets to this may be these bacterial um, iron capsules. So some bacteria make capsules that can enrich iron inside. And these can be big enough for sensing of magnetic fields and so on. So these are like 100 nanometer like, like virus kind of capsules, and they can have iron inside. So this would be something, but it's not very much explored. Thanks, Elke. So next question is by Eje. Uh, she's asking, can these nanoparticles be studied in receptor signaling? Could these nanoparticles, for instance, uh, show how they activate the catalytic domain in receptor dimerization, which you touched upon a bit? Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, what what would be an idea that, that we would have is that basically you, you pull on a protein and then you would think that if the protein is dimerized to another receptor, you would pull it with, right? So, so this could then, if the other molecule would also be fluorescent, you would then see, all right, I pull on the red protein. And when I pull my 50 red proteins to the side, 20 green proteins come with. So I guess two out of five of my receptors at this time are engaged as a dimer, right? So this is a conclusion that, that I could imagine would be accessible experimentally. Um, but of course, one would have to have a very well suited system and as quantitative as possible labeling, which I think are the, the as always, the challenges, right? I mean, <laughs> we know that. Thank you. I guess our next question is by Tara Sitch from here. Excellent mm -hmm. talk. Thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is how such barrier enforces phase control? Is it mainly size based or are there any specific mechanism? What passes and what is not? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. So we don't really know. Aki Kusumi has two models for how his diffusion barrier works, right? So the, 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 I guess the question you're referring to is how does a molecule in the, right? So the membrane has two leaflets. How does a membrane molecule in the outer leaflet, like a lipid, how does it even sense something that is below the bottom leaflet? How does that work? And the idea from Aki Kusumi is that you basically have your actin and bound to your actin are a number of membrane proteins that stick through the membrane and they are kind of like a pillar. So if you have several of them, your molecule, whenever it wants to cross the actin, even though it doesn't interact directly with the actin, it can encounter one of these pillars. And you can then do mathematical modeling and uh, you can calculate that if you have 
20, 30% coverage of your actin filament by pillars, this is already leads to measurable um, confinement in these, these zones. One could also imagine other means. Uh, so for example, there could be interaction with the cytoskeleton via um, phosphatidyl serine. So there's like charge interaction of the cytoskeleton with the bottom leaflet. And then lipids in the bottom leaflet interact with the lipids in the top leaflet. And this could be some sort of lipid interdigitation or lipid phase dependent uh, uh, local confinement. So there's some evidence suggesting that this could be possible as well. Thank you. So second part of the question is, uh, does actin create an obstacle or a trap? In other words, if you pull particle back when it's at the obstacle, will it be trapped or it, will it be trapped in the obstacle or it will go back? Yeah, so um, if it's just a straight line like this, I would expect it to just go back, right? So um, if you imagine having these little pickets, then of course, if you pull it into an area where there's a lot of pickets until it can't move anymore, it may be confined in an area and they kind of have a hard time getting out of there, right? So um, this, I guess, will be dependent on the circumstances. And that's why we are so excited about this axon model where we have just these actin rings every 200 nanometer because it's, it's like it's designed for this experiment, right? So it's very uh, clearly defined. We know where there's actin, where there's no actin. Um, we can fairly straightforward image that after the experiment. So hopefully um, this will allow us to ask questions exactly like that uh, in the future. So can you actually turn off the magnetic field in the middle of the trajectory to see if it starts free diffusion again? Yeah, th I think this is what uh, Gia did. So he has this micro manipulator and I mean, it's, she's not microsecond, you know, so, <laughs> so basically you just have to turn the screw and then it moves out. Um, so, so this works and we, we actually did this. So you can see, I think there's even this time tags. No, not here. Um, I think we have a time tag in the paper. Uh, let me see if I can open it. What do I share? Do I share my screen or do I share that? Oh, I don't share anything. So let no, me just share, share this. Share. So in the paper, we have a time scale. So you can see this is seconds. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. So this is seconds up here. So for 24 seconds, we observe it wiggling around. And then Gia moves in the magnet and it moves for 24 seconds in that direction. And then she removes the magnet and then she needs to find the particle again. Uh, and then she lost some time. So it's, I, I, you know, it's a couple of seconds or a second that you need to remove it. But whenever we did this, you know, we, we, uh, almost all of the time we were able to uh, look at the trajectory before then move it and then have it wiggle around. This was kind of our control to make sure that uh, you can remove it and the particle resumes uh, diffusion, right? Because what we wanted to evade was that we just sort of introduce a big artifact in the, in the protein and just destroy something inside the cell. This is very good. So I have uh, two questions by Dirk mm -hmm. Oleh from here as well. So mm -hmm. Dirk is asking, how do the different membrane anchors perform in terms of pulling force? Do longer transmembrane anchors get stuck more often? This is the first mm -hmm. part of the question about the TM. Second part is the intercellular part. And does the length of the intercellular part have an influence on which kind of structures they get stuck? And I myself mm -hmm. expand the question a bit. Let's say you are looking mm -hmm. at a CD44, which according to Sergio Greenstein, that it interacts with actin cytoskeleton, mm -hmm. right? But according to Aki, most of the membranes actually interact with actin cytoskeleton directly or indirectly forming mm -hmm. the barrier. If you look at different proteins that would in the intercellular part directly interact with actin or not, would it make a difference or would it be an interesting question? 
Yeah, so this is uh, this would be very very interesting. So this is definitely something we uh, we we want to pursue. Um, it is hard work, so uh, uh, you have to you know this is like a single particle method. So we are at it, but uh, we 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 can't really tell you anything about it yet. So now we are focusing first on the in the remaining time we have Gia. We're focusing on the neuron story, but of course we would be very excited to see. You know what is with the huge ion channel. You know we would expect it more likely to get stuck. What is if you have a long uh, transmembrane domain? Is it more likely to interact with the actin? Um, this is of course questions that we would like um, uh, to investigate further using this. Uh, one extension of mm -hmm. this question is mm -hmm. about the TM. I mean, it would be mm -hmm. probably also interesting if you check a. Um, let's say the rough preferring ordered domain preferring mm. TM versus disordered preferring TM. Yeah. Um, and maybe one thing also, I don't know, probably you have done this because mm. this would be the obvious thing that would uh, come to a person who is doing all this phase separation. Uh, if you pull one thing from ordered membrane to disordered phase to disordered phase or disordered phase to ordered phase to, to calculate the force that is needed Absolutely. I think I think one one thing that would also be very interesting, just on the very basic side, on this whole membrane lipid domain field, would be to pull a lot of raftophile molecules on one edge of the cell, and then do some Lordan staining and see if indeed you have a, a change in. Uh, yeah, this is something. Huh? This is something. We, we, yeah. yeah. Don't tell me if you don't see any difference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the next Very question. Shop. Uh, uh. <laughs> next question is by Abhi from Berlin, um, mm -hmm. asking. I wonder that have you also tried this in combination with expansion microscopy? Hmm. No. Um, Can you do like expansion microscopy with live cells where there's still diffusion? Not really. Um, I guess the, that would be an instant kill. Um, like electron microscopy, um, that's still we're waiting for movies. Um, we haven't done it. I guess at po as a post-oc uh, imaging method, why not, right? It might work as well as STORM does. So we might as well do that. I, I don't see a reason why we should not. Um, Thanks, Alge. So next question mm -hmm. is by Betil from Turkey. Uh, the the three-dimensional structure of the proteins may change due to the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. would, that, would that lead to any breaking or reorganization of the bonds mm. and interactions? Or would it change actually the force that you yeah. apply? Yeah, I think, so that's a very good question. I think it would not. So one should not underestimate um, the forces that keep a protein together. So hydrophobic effect is an extremely strong thing. So uh, it would need really uh, uh, many, many piconewtons to pull a single lipid out of a membrane, for example, right? This is something that uh, is many orders of magnitude beyond this. I think we are here in the femtonewton range. We are just a little above KBT, right? So thermal motion, so obviously all membrane proteins, they are never really the same, right? So they all kind of like wiggle around and fold and unfold a little the whole time. So I guess you could sort of say you may favor one conformation a little bit. I can imagine that. But in terms of structural changes that are accompanied by strong binding, I would think that we are below the energies that this can be, right? So if you imagine like a virus binding to a specific receptor, these are significant uh, amounts of energy that get released um, uh, in such a process. So I would think we are below that, that kind of level. Thanks, Alga. Related to this, uh, next question is by Arta, and he is asking with this magnetic manipulation, would it be possible to modulate an ion channel? Uh, yeah, I mean, so this uh, people try to do this using uh, what they called magnetogenetics, um, um, but this, I, as I said, was highly doubted. I think 
people have in animals used magnetic beads to do magne uh, mechano, uh, uh, like the piezo channels, the, the, the mechano sensitive channels. This, I think this has been done, um, but it has not been combined with tracking. So, so I, I think so magnetic beads are used in a lot of different uh, um, applications already in humans, or you can also use it for molecular imaging and so on. Um, um, and I think it has been used to, to pull open these mechanosensitive channels. So earlier there was one question asking if you can do intracellular imaging. And as you said, the challenge would be mm. getting the magnetic nanoparticle inside the cell. Mm. Uh, now we're talking about cellular level, but if you think about an organismal level, do you think this would be possible to somehow label with magnetic nanoparticles the extracellular proteins and somehow move them in a larger scale so that you can create, mm. let's say, a signaling morphogen gradient or something. Um, mm. Do you think this would be possible in a larger scale? I guess, yeah, why not? Um, yeah. So you think that maybe in an embryo, you would sort of uh, inject them in an embryo and then try to artificially enrich in one part of the embryo your magnetic particle coupled. I guess that should be possible, especially because the forces are not that strong. So depending on the distance, right? So, the, so you'd have to adjust probably very carefully because with magnets, the distance dependence is extremely high. Right, so so force goes so crazy. So um, one would have to be be careful about that. But it basically compares to, I mean, if you tried these magnetic beads to pull down proteins, right? If you put the magnet on the side, you can see how it goes. Like, whoosh. So uh, um, imagine that in a little weaker, and I guess it should be possible. Yeah, why not? Thanks. So next, we have usually we have a lot of questions. Okay, just no, uh, it's wonderful. I think it's yeah. really. Uh, I congratulations to you. I mean, this is an amazing format that uh, everybody is so open to discuss. That uh, you really create a great atmosphere here, and uh, uh, I'm very happy that it's appreciated so much by the students and the audience. I mean, this is a yeah. compliment to you and your your setup. Well, well, I, I told you earlier. I'm going to join in the future. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, actually, I'm not doing anything. I'm just uh, sending you a link and reading the questions. That's my only job. Thanks yeah, to you. You, you, you are doing all the job, Helge. It's the style and the atmosphere that makes this happen. That's really nice. So next question is by Christina, and she's asking, are structural changes observed between the actin ring and the anchored protein during stimulation between axon and dendrite? And may these changes mm -hmm. be observed with magnetic nanoparticles? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is this is very very exciting. So there's myosin motors that basically change the the uh, these rings. Um, uh, there's uh, membrane molecules that dynamically become recruited to these rings and uh, then execute some signaling. Um, uh, Right now, I have to say the, the biggest problems we face is actually um, cleaning up the particles, getting really nice particles that bind well, that behave well. So this is something that, that just isn't fantastic at the time, right? So this is still not really out of the box particles. You can buy them by, from many companies, but uh, it has been a very, very frustrating journey to get some particles that really work well. So, so they have not achieved a level that maybe quantum dots have, right? So uh, I think 20 years ago when the quantum dots were first around, there was only one of them that you could use, only the 605 ones were any good, and, and now the 655 ones are still the best. So I think there's still some way to go uh, for these to be really, really nice. Hopefully, I've been now approached by some companies, so hopefully, um, and we can work together with them to make this a more uh, homogeneous and more useful and more tractable uh, sample. Because this is, I have to say right now, our, our biggest problem uh, to get them uh, onto cells in a way. So we, you know, we have to get rid of a lot of them to have the good ones left over and then 
put them on the cell, so they need to do quite some preparation to get them going well. And is it challenging to actually label the proteins on the surface with biotin tag so that you can label the proteins and pull the proteins mm. in and out? No, no, that's 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 very straightforward. So we have the the nanobody that is bound to a biotin. So the nanobody GFP interaction is in the nanomolar range, and uh, um, by controlling the amount of biotin nanobody we add, we can control uh, a little bit that you bind monovalently, right? So if you add less nanobodies than you assume to be surface proteins, then uh, or if you pre-coat your particles with nanobodies, then you can uh, uh, have the equilibrium shift towards um, having mostly only one molecule bound to your nanoparticle, because of course the cross-linking would also be a worry if you have these 200 nanometer size uh, bits. But that is um, something that has been um, done by many labs for many different particles. It's a very uh, common coupling chemistry. Okay, so then a related question comes from Hussein Emre. Can new neuronal stimulation be modulated by moving NMDA channel, let's say, in neurons out of the synaptic space using fluorescent magnetic nanoparticles? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, you have to ask Choke. Huh? So, uh, um, so Daniel Choke uh, in his lab, he has been able to show that um, in the post-synaptic density of excitatory synapses, there are glutamate receptors. And uh, once these are opened, they uh, close and then they are desensitized for a while. So they can't reopen. And uh, this is why if you do two quick pulses, one after the other, the first pulse is gonna be higher than the second pulse. It's called pair pulse depression. And uh, what indeed happens is that these desensitized receptors, they diffuse out of synapses and can become replaced um, by fresh receptors. So if you abolish diffusion inside the synapse, the paired pulse depression is much stronger. So the difference between the first peak and the second peak is much higher than if you have diffusion. So diffusion is actually important for the exchange of used receptors for, for fresh ones to achieve high cadence, high frequency uh, signaling. So I could imagine that indeed, if you would forcefully remove molecules or keep them out of the synapse, you could have a similar uh, effect. I do not think that if you have a receptor, so receptors are linked to the postsynaptic density via stargazing and PSD95, I do not believe that you can pull using the magnetic force uh, uh, an anchored ion channel out of the postsynaptic density. For that, that's just too many binding sites and, and it's not gonna, I don't think that's gonna work. So one, one thing for me to understand is rings, mm. the actin rings, um, are they like a, like a spring or they are rings next to each other? So they are, they are not continuous. No. I don't think they are continuous. Um, now that it has been shown that myosin actually cross-links them and seems to pull them together and they can widen and become closer again. Um, I think it's really even an exciting question if they if they have actin always in one direction, right? So if there's only plus directed actin one way, that would be weird because that would mean an axon would have a left and a right, right? Because there would be the plus side this way, always this way. So it would always go up with the plus end on one side of the axon and down on the other side of the axon. I can't imagine that. So I would assume that you have them go plus and minus in both directions, every single ring. So I would think it's rather ring structures than one continuous spiral. Also, that would be a very long spiral. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so last question, Helge, by Jan Su. Uh, is it possible to temporarily block the ion channels between the actin rings with biochemicals and reduce the electrical activity of the ion channels to reduce membrane protein stacking possibility? Okay, I do not feel qualified to answer that. Um, that's 
can can you pose that question again? It's, it's, it sounds very interesting. Uh, is it possible to temporarily block the ion channels between the actin ring with the biochemicals and reduce the electrical activity of the ion channels to reduce the membrane protein stacking possibility? Hmm. Okay, well, there are pharmacological inhibitors of voltage-gated channels uh, in the initial segments. Um, so that should be possible. Um, I could imagine calcium having or a calcium influx having an influence on membrane protein motion because calcium, of course, for example, um, uh, interferes with PIP2, you know, charged lipid cytoskeleton interaction. So that's, for example, one important uh, process in dendritic spines when calcium flows in, uh, the, the membrane relaxes from the cytoskeleton and you can sort of like, through new polymerization, you can make a bigger spine. Um, but I haven't thought about that. And that would be a hard experiment to do, I guess. But uh, yeah, yeah, well, I could imagine it. I'm not saying it's happening, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Hage, as always. It is such a pleasure to yeah, listen Yeah, likewise. To you. This is really great. I'm gonna join you. When is the next one, next week? Yeah, next week, every week, okay. Wednesday. This is really nice. Very nice format. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you yeah, all for Yeah, I'm sorry that questions. I'm the only person that you see whole talk, but, um, you know, there are always downsides. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's great. I really enjoy it. It's very uh, nice atmosphere here. Uh, it doesn't feel as weird as it should um, sitting in front of your, uh, your computer. The only thing I can't take is that you have a talk sitting down, right? I think that's so strange. Um, yeah, I have yeah. seen actually people giving talks standing up in front of the computer as well. Maybe yeah. I should do that next time. All right. Yeah, thank you much for having me. I hope you enjoyed uh, uh, the paper. I, um, we, everyone enjoyed the paper a lot. I really get good feedback on this paper. And thanks very much for joining us, having time for us today. Sure. For a fantastic presentation. And congratulations again, Gia and you, for this great paper. Thank you. Diaz and the audience, please uh, feel free to write us anytime if you have questions. We'd be happy to help. Thanks a lot, Helge.